Hello, welcome to the Charity Impact Podcast, where our purpose is to learn more about how effective charities and individuals achieve social change or social impact. I'm your host, Alex Blake, and this podcast is brought to you by Akida Consulting, where I help charities to develop strategy, secure funding, and navigate a range of challenges and opportunities. If you listen to the podcast, I'd love to hear what you think. You can either leave a review on Spotify, Apple, etc., or tag me in a post on LinkedIn or Twitter using at Alex blake underscore k-e-d-a or drop me an email for details on all episodes with notes and links to resources head to our website kedaconsulting.co.uk i'm joined today by paul Irwin, founder of try life paul's got a background in working with disadvantaged young people from around the world and he created an interactive film series try life aimed at educating young people about the consequences of their actions if you remember the old choice-based adventure books, Try Life is interactive digital video version of those. Paul will explain a bit more to us as we go through it. Paul's talent at creating and curating content has also seen incredible success in social media. He's amassed a huge following for Try Life and reaches up to 188 million people per week. In one month, Try Life managed to reach 65% of all Facebook users in America with no marketing or advertising spend and using just one mobile phone. Paul was the very first winner of HRH Pitch at the Palace Awards, which is arguably the UK's most prestigious competition for tech startups. And most recently, he started developing an interactive film with the heads of the Bloods, Crips and Mexican Mafia in South Central LA with the support of Facebook and the producer of Blade Runner. That's quite a bio, Paul. There's loads of stuff that we'll get into there. So welcome to the podcast. Nice one, Mitch. Nice to be here. Cheers. And so we'll just start at the beginning, I think. Tell us a bit about your background and kind of how you first got into working with young people and how it all sort of started. Yeah, man. So I was volunteering in the local community centre, basically. I'd like, I'd been put into well, like a bed and breakfast, I guess it was, like for the council. It wasn't like a care home. It was just bed and breakfast when I was a teenager. And when I came out, I'd been given the keys to a flat when I was like sort of 16, like leaving care. And I was going to the local community centre and just accessing the services there. There was just one worker that asked us if I would go and help out with some of the the younger kids who were giving them a bit of grief. And I decided to go and volunteer. But I just fell in love with like with youth work really. I just like I've just there was some I don't know what it was. I just it was just something brilliant about engaging with young people, especially like pretty hard to reach young people and then seeing the, the sort of journey and seeing the development. So I started off as a volunteer and then um, I started getting some sessional work, like, you know, a few hours here and there with like in, in youth centres and then part time and then full time work. I worked all over the North East, up in Ashton. It was mainly Battle Hill, Wall's End, North Shields to, to start off with and then up in Ashton and New Biggin. And then from there, I ended up working in South East London with inner city gangs. I uh, ended up in Jamaica, working on a homeless project, worked with young people from Chernobyl, from Israel, Palestine. I worked in Bradford after uh, the race riots and turned, I was an area community development manager and turned the, the local uh, youth centre into, drew down the RDF money and turned a local community centre, a youth centre, sorry, into a community centre. And then I came back to the North East and I was working with Bernardo's teenage pregnancy team. and. That's like sort of when the financial crisis happened. Just before you go on, Paul, sorry, I'll just I'll keep interrupting you with little questions. Yeah, man. Uh, but how how did it come about that you ended up working all over the world? Was that through one organisation, or like how how did that happen? No, it was just like it was just randomly meeting people. Like I was when I was out in Jamaica, I met the head of Bradford Youth Service, and he was like, "What are you doing when you finish here, Jordy?" And I was like, "I'm not sure." <laughs> and he was like, "Come to Bradford. We've just had some riots. Come and help right. us." And it was more like just meeting people or opportunities arising. So like the work with uh, young people in, in Chernobyl that came about through an organization that I met when I was working up in Ashton and they were giving young people uh, from Chernobyl the chance to come over to the UK. And I don't know if this is right. I, th- I think I remember it right because it was a long time ago, but I'm sure that like, the stats or the facts were that three months over here put like three years on their life just like with contamination and everything, you know, from the, the nuclear fallout. So mm. um, the young people would come over here and it was a bit like a, like a cultural exchange type thing, but there was no exchange going back, if you know what I mean. Mm. And like, they'd, uh, they'd be housed with families over here. And 
I mean, some of the photographs that those young people brought back were pretty bleak. You know what I mean? They were mm. where they were from and where they were being brought to were two very, very different places. So yeah, it was just like just randomly meeting people, I think, and just I always like at most I tried to stay in a job for like three years because like I sort of felt like my productivity would like run out after that. Like I'd go in with a lot of enthusiasm into a community mm. and say with Bradford. It was like drawing down that ERDF money, right? That's like, you know, it's a big, it's not a small undertaking. And and then we went and employed like local people to take over my role. So I'd done myself out of a job. Like the management committee had set up, the chairperson became centre manager, a young volunteer that I met. I got him, I brought him in as a um, caretaker because the community centre was being broke into all the time. And then like having someone local there who's taking care of the building and who cares about the building, that had a big impact on it. And then he ended up going to university and training to become a youth worker. So it was like sort of, if my job was done, it would be done by me outdoing myself of work, really. And plus after three years, I sort of felt like I was burning out anyway. Like I needed like a new challenge and for a fresh worker to come in and take what I'd built mm. and for them to to continue on. I know some work as I worked in organizations for like a long time, but like, I just, it, like that wasn't really for me. Sort of, I burnt myself out like pretty quickly, even though three years is not quick, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess like you've mentioned before, how you go about things, you know, if you get some, get excited about something, then you'll, you'll really go at it intensively. So I guess that's like, you'll obviously get a lot done in that period of time. And then, as you say, you kind of hit burnout and then you need to, uh, kind of step away and move on but if you're handing over to the young people to take things on then obviously you've kind of you've like completed that project in a way and you've you've kind of passing it on in the right yeah. way so sorry i interrupted you as you you were kind of get into um like 2008 global financial crisis yeah let's pick up from that i but i was another thing just to continue with what you were just saying there as well i was like diagnosed with mania during lockdown so i've done quite a lot of therapy through a bursary and I think like that like all started to make sense. Like that kind of thing, that sort of very short, like intense bursts of work. Mm-hmm. Or like just concentrated bits of work, not maybe short, but like concentrated bits of work. And I think like that all it sort of it all made sense when I when I'd done that bursary during uh, lockdown. But getting back to the financial crisis, I like our team was about twenty six people at the time and we had like a multidisciplinary team. So we had Progression workers to get like, so this is a teenage pregnancy team. So we had progression workers to get, to help young people get into employment, training, education. We had sexual health workers. We had midwives. We had forensic psychologists. It was just a, just a, an amazing team. Like just having like se- everything from sexual health work all the way through to like a psychologist, like sat around the table all working on the same families. It was we're doing some amazing work. We'd won a British Midwifery Award, British Medical Journal Award, All Parliamentary Award. And then obviously the financial crisis happened. And then austerity, like I think it just stripped the, stripped the team down to about three people, five people overnight. And then you could see that breakfast clubs, after school clubs, community centres, youth centres, libraries, swimming pools, sure star children's centres, everything was all being shut. Those are the things that I benefited from. Like, I was a young parent, and uh, those services are not just, like, the young people that's been affected by it. It's, like, the support that the parent gets from it as well. So there's now been, like, well, almost like a full generation now who where the parents haven't been supported, and them young people haven't had that external support from anywhere else. So it was just, it was horrible because, especially if you look at that one worker that took the time with me when I was, like, sort of, I don't know, nineteen twenty or whatever I was, and uh, started volunteering. That one work, I would have been one of them who would have been cut. But then look how many people I've went on to work with. And and then some of the young people I've empowered who are now workers, look how many people they've went on to. And youth services have just been completely destroyed. I think it's 69% cuts around the country and 97% in some parts of the Northeast. Mm. And that's like, that's a lot of skill set that's just been thrown like on a scrap heap. So a lot of very highly skilled people who it's it helps support the police that help support like, a, a lot of things when you've got that external agency able to go and engage with people. And not just that, like all of the, those services that have just been cut and mental health services and everything, you know, that's just a real shame. So that's where Tri-Life came from. I just thought like we've got to try and do something to engage with young people. 
And then I just thought, well, where are young people at? They're sat on the mobile phone and sometimes I've got to text my kids just to get a response out of them when they're in the same room. Do you know what I mean? Whereas in the past, you would go and send detached youth workers to the chippy or the park or whatever. If young people are on social media, then let's go and engage with them there. And if you look at the, the most popular pages on social media, they're, they're like music. So what are young people into? They're into gaming, music, film, and the most connected generation, most effortly diverse generation that Britain's ever known. And they consume more hours of media a week than they get sleep. So I just thought, wouldn't it be good to try and create something, like co-create something that's like truly interactive and take like youth work theory and apply it in, into like media. And I'd had, um, I'd had the chance to work on a couple of film projects. So a production company had asked us if I would help out with a film about teenage pregnancy and it won a BAFTA. And then another production company asked us if I would help out with a film about knife crime and not won a Royal Television Society Award. And then I'd worked with the BBC as well, helping them organise events for young people to go and try like different forms of like the creative arts. So they could go and work with the guys from like Wallace and Gromit or go and work with a caller or make a film in three days. And it was about giving young people the chance to try different forms of media that they wouldn't normally have access to so they could do like weather reporting or or fashion or whatever so paul with that with the, those uh sort of opportunities that came up with those films there like obviously you brought the expertise in terms of the, the youth work and and that side of things did you have any any sort of knowledge around like making films and stuff before or did did you just kind of learn as you got involved in that stuff like how did you kind of pick up those sort of skills i didn't have any skills in that there was one person i met it was at a sexual health conference for young people where i was talking and they were wanting to make a film so they were there trying to unearth like teenage parents and try to get in and i mean this guy just connected it would just got on and I invited him and his team up to Newcastle to come and meet some of the groups I'd formed um, in the Northeast, some of the young parent groups. And um, that's like sort of how I got into it. And I took a group of young people down to a workshop in London. And then as I saw what he was trying to do with it, like I just became fascinated with it. And then I think it's then it was like a spark where I was like, wow, this is brilliant. Like I can take what I'm doing like on a small group level and then like show that like to a, a larger audience. And it was more about like, for me, you know, young parents get like so much uh, stigma and stuff. And some of the best parents I know are young parents actually. Do you know what I mean? I was 17 when my son was born, you know, and uh, he was the first one in the family to go to university. And he went to Kings, you know, he got a first in social economics and political theory. He's now a chartered accountant. He lives on the quayside with his, boy, with his boyfriend. And like some some of the parents I've worked with are like absolutely amazing parents. But if you look in the general media at how young people or young parents are portrayed, it's normally that the guy's absent and the the woman is promiscuous, and that's how it's displayed. You know, it's just wrong. It's um, and not just the media as well, is it? So much stigma, like from other parents and general public and that sort of thing. Probably good point is to give a little shout out to a really great charity we both know northeast young dads and lads projects up here yeah. said doing great work with young dads in the region and still like a big issue why they formed and what they're working on is that kind of stigma and even with like health professionals who should be supporting those young parents and i think in some cases they're kind of supporting the mum but then always see the dad as either like a you no know, potential kind of threat or risk or you know they're kind of seen as a wrong one from from the start so there's a big big kind of piece of work to do there as well just look at the suicide rate in young men you know it's like the biggest killer of of men it's the biggest killer of young people and a lot of uh, a lot of that comes down to like denied access to kids and stuff like that or they do some amazing work that uh, organization like, i know them really well and i've done a, a podcast with the young lads and every year i go and buy the honey so they've got these little beehives dotted all over the place and get the lads trained up in the produce like honey and I get it at Christmas and give it out as a Christmas box. You know, it's beautiful. It's such a brilliant project, like. Oh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll stick a link in in the show notes and a link to that podcast as well. So sorry, I interrupted you again. Where <laughs> where was we at? So yeah, so it's kind of getting into like where did you? So obviously you kind of got involved a bit and picked up the interest, and then was it a case of kind of like you you got the bug, you got the idea for Try Life, and then you had to like really 
just teach yourself and just go deep into like how how it all works and stuff yeah so like i looked at it and thought like this is like there's an opportunity there to like sort of you know to uh to show like the reality of some of these issues because how they're portrayed on the mainstream tv isn't isn't always fair or accurate or whatever and and it was just a sort of champion of or like just like you know have a counter voice against like some of that when you see like reports in the paper calling kids feral and stuff like that that kind of language isn't helpful you know what i mean they're children you know what i mean and like i used to love the choose your own adventure books when i was a kid and it was like you would read a part of the story and and then it would give you a choice go turn to page 10 to go to the castle turn to page 14 to go to the haunted forest and then you would make a choice turn to that page read the story and if you died you could go back and try a different route so like, i wanted to do that in film and i've been brought up with like sort of video games from your spectrum to your amiga to playstation and stuff and i know that uh, games consoles get like bad stick or like you know gaming in general but i disagree completely you know like it's like where else can you go and spend like Ten pound on eBay and, and get like I want, like you know nearly a hundred hours of like entertainment or well my kids having them sat playing video game obviously they're out like active and doing stuff as well as just sitting vegetating but taught me like, a lot of a lot of crucial skills and I'm a massive advocate of video games and I knew where my kids were when they were sat with a couple of mates playing a video game in the living room and not out in the park like I was causing trouble or whatever. It was yeah, uh, it's just from my. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to like do loads and loads of sh shout outs for Northeast Young Dads, but they were, they've got the gaming project and stuff. They've got like their own kind of moderated channel and stuff. And then Kev, the founder there, was saying it. So one of the one of the things is that where the guys are kind of playing the game, and obviously it's all now online, and you've got your headset and you're kind of like having a chat and a bit of banter. That's a it's an opportunity where they can actually talk and like you know they'll start to open up and have a chat about some real issues as well as just gaming so it kind of has uh has that benefit but then like what is what are some of the other things you think are the kind of some of the skills and things that people young people pick up from playing these sorts of games well like everything from like sort of teamwork during lockdown so my daughter i was like 20 when she gave birth and she had the grandson oscar who's like he's nearly six now so i was like i was a, a grander at 39 man right and um but he's brilliant. It's the best thing in the world that's ever happened. You know what I mean? He's absolutely fantastic. And she's just had a little Roddy now about four months ago. And but during lockdown, so I bought I bought him a headset and there was like me, my son and Oscar playing uh, Halo. I mean, he was hopeless to start off with just running around, just, you know what I mean? Just doing whatever he was doing. But after a little bit, just like his communication skills came on massively because like you said, he's got like, he was talking to us to give... I know this sounds mad, but <laughs> it was the middle of lockdown. My daughter's like home with a five-year-old kid having to keep him entertained. And like just for an hour or an hour and a half every day or whatever, mm -hmm. like he could come on. She knew he was safe. He was only with me and my son. So he's with his uncle. He's with his granddad. And like we're having a bit of banter and having a laugh. And like everything, his communication skills came on. He's, we could have a chat. You know, he would say if he was feeling sad or whatever. He's missing his school friends and... It was just brilliant. He, he, everything from his eye, hand eye coordination and, and a lot of things improved. And, and I think for some people, when you can escape the real world and go and play, go on a little adventure or do something just to remove yourself away from like reality for a little bit, I just think it's got to be a good thing. It's no different to imagine if uh, books had been like, so some people think it's like, you know, like, oh, you're being antisocial, you're sitting on your phone, you're sitting on your on your video game. But imagine if books were invented today. What would people say? Like, oh, what are you doing? You've got your head in that boot again. Are you living in a dream world? It's no different. It's just, just media, isn't it? It's, it's. You're still learning. You're still picking up stuff. Yeah, I see that meme every now and then come around online. You know, it's a picture of, like everyone on the tube or whatever on their mobile phone saying like antisocial, and then you see like the old fashioned picture of everyone reading the newspapers. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's kind of just the same. Just the the tech moves on, but <laughs> people are the same interrupted you again but it's a good little tangent so you're just kind of getting on to talking about what trial life is so it's like the old adventure books so i just thought like we've got to try and engage with young people online we've got to try and do something like on mass so like let's create an interactive story where the user gets to decide what happens so do you go to the party yes or no do you if when you go to the party you get offered a 50 50 chance of either pills or we do you take it yes or no and if you do take it 
let's have one option where the character seems to be okay, right? So they've just like took the pill and hey, I'm I'm having a brilliant time, right? But it's got to have a consequence the next day. Or what happens if the character has unprotected sex? Obviously, this is aimed at young people, so it's like a teen drama. But imagine it's unprotected sex and, and they go to the sexual health clinic. What I wanted to do was demystify what actually happens in the sexual health service. And everyone's heard of chlamydia, everyone's heard of gonorrhea or syphilis or whatever, right? But what do they actually do? And which ones can you treat and which ones are curable? And like, what's the process, right? So instead of it being like about my lack of knowledge or your lack of knowledge or anyone else's, if the character has un unprotected sex, they can become pregnant or get any of the STIs or be lucky enough and escape like with nothing. There's there's no impact. So we could have set that like using like uh, mathematics, like just probability of like what's your chances of getting chlamydia or whatever. But we decided to give everything an equal opportunity. So the game engine would just pick one of the endings randomly. And the character will always be naive to to that. So regardless of what it is, even if she finds out she's pregnant or if if it's chlamydia, for example, right, which is um, much more common, she, the, the character, when she goes in and she tests positive for chlamydia, will be like, oh, my God, chlamydia, what's that? How have I got chlamydia? And the sexual health uh, worker in the scene, the sexual health worker in the scene, will provide the advice and guidance that they would give young people at that time and explain what it is Express, explain what the course of action is so it's not about the user's uh, lack of knowledge because like you know you'll see like a group of young people might be like some of them giggling or whatever or like really intrigued by like oh i want to learn this and it's like it's always the character's naivety that will be the thing that will prompt like something within the the learning like or if you imagine i'm going to offer you a spliff and and like and I can do it where like in film it's quite intimidating. So you get the you get the viewers who are like, ooh, like what do we do? Like he's going to end up in like. And so some of them will press no to see how much trouble you're getting because it seems like a really intimidating thing. And if if uh, they do press no, what I can do is film that no ten times, ten different times. So people think it's a bit of variation in the storyline. But actually, it's arming young people with refusal tools. Like, no, I can't. Like, my mom's coming. Like, no, no, I've got to go to my grandma's house or whatever it is. And people think it's a little bit of variation in there, but it's not actually. It's just giving young people, like, some of the smarts of how to get out of a situation. So nothing's ever glorified in trial life. Everything, everything negative has a consequence. So who did you have involved, Paul? What funding did you have? Where did the funding come from? Roughly how much was it? And then, like, were you doing pretty much everything or did you have like a social media person and someone doing the filming and what the first film we wrote 455 pages of script and we didn't realize that we'd wrote like two-third of lord of the rings trilogy we wrote the world's most complex interactive film ever made and we launched that that was the, like mainly drugs and alcohol and sexual health when i started so i found this pot of money ardf money proof of concept fund from north star ventures so because the financial crisis had happened, I think the top nine charities were taking like 90 percent of all money. And there was just there was no money about for smaller organizations. This is like when it was like the death of a lot of community projects and stuff. So um, I found this proof of concept fund, which was for like new businesses, like doing something innovative. And I, and I drew down 200,000 euros, which I think was like about 178,000. When the funding application was taught, it started to take shape and it looked like we were in with a good chance of of actually securing some money. That's when, like, obviously I'd been on, on film set, like, with the, the two films. But then that's when I started to throw myself into filmmaking and I made a profile on an acting website and I went and just put myself in as an extra uh, on a few films just so I could, like, sort of, seeing the mechanics of it plus I was plus I didn't I needed to try and find a crew so I went and do you know what I mean so you're on these film sets tapping up <laughs> the cameraman and stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I was just like the first couple I was like I just done as I was told and I saw like how not to run a set and like how to basically and uh, there was a couple of people that um uh weren't the best at you know, getting the best out of the team and I'd applied for a role which was 
down in Sheffield, and it was the guys uh, behind the uh, like Reverend and the Makers, John McClure and Chris McClure. They had wrote like this little mini series called Lies, and I landed like the lead role of like the dad, <laughs> their dad, back in the nineties, when they found out that like Father Christmas apparently isn't real and the two fairy and some other things so it was like a, sp- a piece of spoken word and it was like a little mini series and i went down to sheffield this is like the height of like arctic monkeys and reverend and the makers and stuff like that and the guy on set was absolutely brilliant he was just i loved how like he motivated everyone and kept people going so when i finished filming that i went over to him and i said right i know like i've been acting like you know like i'm a you think I'm an actor like on your set but like I've got this script here will you come to Newcastle and help us make it and he was like are you kidding me <laughs> I was like no. <laughs> I've got like some money come to Newcastle come and stay at my house and let's go and do it and then I'd uh I'd I'd worked with like three young writers three lads and like we literally just worked out how to make interactive films we just came up with we just wrote it and they were really naive you know we just dived in and and done it and like I say, like we made a lot of mistakes on the first one. So if you imagine like the sexual health scene, we'd wrote this, we'd done this uh, scene second last and it was Charlotte who played Sophie was obviously in a, in a pretty bad way because the character just uh, found out that she'd tested positive for HIV. And the last scene after that was when she got the all clear. But now I've got two actresses who have got mascara running down the face and like red eyes and need to go for a walk and need to go back into makeup and like you know need a few minutes to to compose themselves again so little things like that cost with time and doing a fight scene was like the worst thing in the world like the amount of camera angles you've got to get and stuff like that and it, like, it literally took like a full day you know just to get this one scene right and when you've got 455 of them we just quickly realized that like we could do things better but the good thing is we've never made the same mistake twice and with right the second time we could streamline it a little bit, streamline the storytelling, streamline the film production, the development stage, and then make it look a little bit better. And then the third time we would learn again from our mistakes. And like we just got the process right. We've done seven now. And we just like we just learned really. But it was it was mainly it came about as well from having like good people around us. So like everyone sitting down and like let's just like let's walk through this and like let's just go from the top and like let's just walk through it and walk through it and and like, I wasn't like trained in film I, I hadn't done any of that but I seem to be pretty good at bringing people together in a team and getting the best out of them do you know what I mean so I think that's one of my skill sets and oh, on answer to your question like no there's me doing social media it was just me uh-huh. like what were you doing with social media before you before it launched, were you just doing like little clips of you making the films and like do kind of teasing it that way? Yeah, so less a video really. So this was like early face, like in our Facebook days. I think it was still like a lot of young people were on there, and there was a lot of stigma around like engaging with young people online. And Facebook wasn't really being used by like you know the older generations at this point. So it was still like. So what what sort of year were we talking about now? 2012, 2012, about 10 years ago. And then you've got to remember, I mean, like everything right now, it's like, you know, Zoom and not having to go down to London from Newcastle for a meeting, because every all my meetings were like, come and meet in person, meet in person. Yeah, yeah. There's times I've went and met the BBC, man, and or like other organisations and everyone's sitting on a salary, but when you're working alone, like, and, and it's your money, it's like, there's been times where it's like, do I pay rent or do I go down for this meeting? And it was all face to face, but you now the world's a very different place now, isn't it? And Zoom's a lot more acceptable. And Facebook was very, very different back then to what it is now. And to start off with, I was doing like I was broadcasting like uh try life is this and try life is that and try life is this and try life is that. And it sort of I didn't really know what I was doing. And then I think I got to like about a thousand people. And it would like it just wasn't getting above that. And then I sort of realized that what I was doing, if I looked at it as, as a TV channel rather than like a, a, a Facebook page, if I looked at it as a TV channel, what I was doing basically is we are the BBC, we are BBC, 
we're BBC, we're BBC, and that's the only thing I was putting out. And everyone sitting there watching it, going, "Oh, this is cool, right?" Oh, well, like, well, what's going on? So I was like shouting about who we were, but not about what we were doing. And I, I started to change it, where I just like, I started to ask, I started to ask questions, and instead of like, I don't know why, like, uh, I viewed it that way. I was like, I was probably precious about the brand, like not wanting to upset anyone. I was still in full youth work mode, and. I hadn't really looked at it from a, an external point of view. And then all of a sudden, it's something twigged. And I thought, let's engage with the audience because that's what it's about. It's about trying life. Who wants to get involved in this? Who wants to come and audition? I'm going to need some music. Does anyone know any locations? And the minute I started putting that kind of stuff out, it started to go up and up and up. And I remember it getting past like the size of St. James's Park, like the football stadium. And I was like looking at football stadiums so I could like try and figure out, like on Google, to try and figure out how many people that looked like. Because once it got like 20, 30, 40,000. But it got to 10,000 and I crapped myself. I woke up one morning and it was like 10,000. I was like, whoa, I hope this is going to be uh, good because like, I'm going to look like a right, uh, a right a numpty in front of 10,000 people. And then the next morning it was like, you know, 13,000, 14,000. And I noticed that, like, once we got a 10,000, you were guaranteed to put on, like, maybe a person a day, at least. And then it just, like, it just started to grow exponentially. And then all of a sudden... Is that just, is that just like, an algorithm thing of, like, once you get to a certain level, then, like, everything you put out is kind of getting pushed more and you, it just kind of multiplies? I don't know if the algorithm works that way now because, like, Facebook is just is completely changed it just feels like I, I don't even know if i advocated anymore to be honest to young people but back in the day i think i think it was because back then it was less advertising and like if you look at facebook now it's you know it might be a friend and then a group and then an advert and it's like every third thing that you look at is now an advert it's it feels like a penny arcade of just adverts that's all it feels like now and i don't know if that's healthy like, I'm not quite sure where I sit with it because I've now got 7 million people on there. But it feels like it's less about your connection and people and more just an advertising reel. And if that's what young people are being exposed to, I, like, I'm, I'm not quite sure where I sit with it. I think it's I think it's lost its way. I, I think, like, back in the day, I just, like, I kept pushing it. I just, back in the day, I just started to engage with people and, like, just talk to them as if they were in the room. And I think that's what changed. And then... And then I decided to start putting out like a positive quote because like everything on the news is just like full of hate and full of, you know, like immigrants this, immigrants that. And you look at like the newspapers and all of this kind of stuff and they were like really pushing this like horrible agenda and like it's it's just vile. It's just like drip, 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 drip of hate and hate and hate. And uh, so I started, I thought I'm not going to engage in politics. I'm not going to do religion. But let's start putting some positive stuff out just putting like a little positive quote or even something uh, funny. Like uh, one of the health professionals I was working with, it said, we put a post out asking young people how far they'd walked and like no one replied. And I'm like, well, it's a crap, it's a crap question, mate. So I was like, so I put a post out saying like, uh, from the share to Mordor, how far have you walked today? And it got like thousands and thousands and thousands of like, Thingies. And I know it's not like in miles or whatever the Shire to Mordor, but some people were like, I've not even left the Shire. The Shire. I've, I've been sitting at home smoking weed all day and some people are like, mate, I've been to Mordor and back. And like, and like, it just like picked up that engagement. And then you get some people having a bit of like, you know, some someone would come up with something funny and it would encourage more people. And, and then when it come to the like audition process, like, and sourcing, we sort of crowdsourced like talent. So, like, we'll put a post out saying, like, do we know any animators? So everyone that was already on that page started tagging their friends who were, like, pretty good at illustration and, and stuff like that. So we started to engage with people that way. And then we needed, like, someone to come and do hair and makeup. Then we needed, like, a location for for whatever. And someone had tagged someone that worked in the college and we ended up going. And, and then, like, I'd, go, I'd post. So I would still broadcast, but I was, like, engaging. And then I'd be like, oh, today we're at time at college. Thanks very much for such and such for putting me in touch with these. And then that's where it was filmed. So like we would report back on like that engagement and how it had helped move the project on. And when you were getting people for like those different roles like animators and what have you, were you specifically looking 
to employ young people in those roles as kind of part of the impact of the work or was it just kind of whoever was the best person that you could find no so it was just all just young people really i mean uh not everyone that worked on the project was under 25 but i'd say the vast majority are massively and like we didn't want to use licensed music we wanted to find new music we wanted to find new talent where we needed spoken word we needed you know, a cast, we needed actors, animators, just everything. And if I went into, so the, the process that naturally developed out of it was I worked with like professionals and they asked them what the, what were the main issues in that area? So say for the knife crime uh, episode, cause that's an easier one to use as an example. So I went down and worked with like the police and then so I'm saying like in a room, right? I brought like around the room in this one room, there's like someone there from a and &E department who are dealing with like, I don't know if it was like 12 stabbings a week or a month or whatever, but it was, it was a lot. And and then someone from the mental health team and then someone from youth offending team, then like a couple of people from the police. And then maybe it's like someone from social services, someone from children's services, someone from youth service, and then people from organizations who are there try to tackle knife crime and a lot of those people had like had lived experience so they'd set up social enterprises or or charities because they lost someone so it was like for the first time this is when i started to realize what the what the process was for the first time i looked at all of these different agencies and thought wow these are all working on the same issue but this was probably the first time they've all been brought together like collectively and because it's not a council meeting or some you know some kind of shout you shout you meeting whose fault is it it's well actually all just taking an hour out to sit down and i'm like tell me what like what am i like what are the main issues here and the police have been brilliant every time the police are like right so we see a lot of young people doing x y and z and that's one of my story threads or what happens is sometimes the girl like some the person who's carrying the knife will get stabbed like much of the time because the person defending themselves is you know is gonna get that knife and, and kill them rather than be killed or the young girls carry the knives or carry the drugs because they think they get pulled the lads think they get pulled less off the police and they'll get arrested so there's another story thread and then if she's arrested does she say the drugs are his or does she take the rap for it there's like an extra branch of the story and like oh and but like what other positive things you know some uh, people can get out of these gang situations and end up in a as we really well-rounded people and so they, that forms the basic framework of the storyline and then when i go and engage with young people in a college or a university i can utilize the like say like a union college uh, drama students film production fashion hair and makeup english students when i say film production drama advertising marketing health promotion youth work students you name it and i can like basically nearly get a full campus involved and um if there's 30 students doing uh hair and makeup and i'm filming for two weeks why not just get like two of them on like day release like every day so each of them get a chance to come and work on set they get out of the college they're getting some the, the, something like work experience i'll pay them for the day they get paid for the day they get something on the cv they get to come on set and have a look at a film being made like it's real life it's real life first job first thing on your cv there you go and like that's like how the the process like sort of naturally developed and we just got better and, and more refined it bringing them agencies in and then we evaluated it eventually with the the last one or had Sunderland university evaluate it and i'll send you some of the stats and stuff like that i mean it's like that kind of participation what's beautiful about it uh alex says you've got like You've got the agencies coming in and telling you what the what the horror stories are and what the success stories and that forms the basic framework for the so this is stuff they say day in day out day in day out and then when i go and engage with the young people so the 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 work as have took ownership of it because they're helping to create something right which shows what they're dealing with from many different views right whether it's police or a &E. and then when i go and engage with the young people like it's not just the workers that are saying this day to day it's the young people and the young people are like oh that happened to my mate and what they've done is they've done this and then them little nuances and them little like the, those little things help join those dots and put like the reality in there and then what you get is you get uh workers buying in to buying into it because like they know like that's what they experience and then the young people 
also buy into it. And because I'm not the police or whoever, and I'm going and saying, will you help us make this film? It's about knife crime, and this is what happens to the character. And they're like, oh, my God, that happened to my mate. Like, the kids can recognise the patterns as well as like, the workers. And the young people, sorry. And then, you know, like, I'm working with a load of drama students or with a load of English students and saying, right, let's write something. Like, let's write something real. And then, like, from that, I find young people that are actually living that life and, like, are involved in whatever. And, like, that's, like, we don't necessarily have to... It's not It's not all act, It's not actors. It's young people that will come across. And then that's how the product's built. It's built up like that. We've got buying from the workers, and then we've got young people advocating it. And, you know, if you get the message right, young people will readily share your work. And if you don't, they'll filter you out because you can fast forward and rewind TV now. You haven't got a captive audience anymore. You're, like, you, you can't just bombard people with information and hope that the message will get through. I think people are sat forward now and want to interact. You know what I mean? Can we uh, go back to the social media? So I guess it would just be interesting to understand a bit about like where, yeah, like where did it go from getting those kind of 10,000 people to like some of those huge numbers that I've heard mentioned around where you've had such a high proportion of like American Facebook users at one time accessing Try Life and things like that. What did you do? What worked well in terms of it? Yeah, so like I said, like when we stopped broadcasting and started like involving people, that was a massive thing. And I just like just started asking people, like, does anyone know where we can do this? Has anyone got this? So like, that was like, a massive form of engagement. And then people saying that what they were doing actually was either helping or contributing towards something was brilliant. And then when we were on set, I know a lot of film sets are closed, like, you know, for social media and stuff, you know, like you can't post anything, you can't do anything. But it was the complete opposite for us. I was like telling all of the young people to get your phones out, get this tagged up. And then obviously like other young people saying, young people making a film, they're like, oh my God, what's this? This is going to be cool. And what what else helped with was when we were on set, say after day two, I would have the editor do like a 10 second trailer. And then the next day, so you'd get all of the actors going on to see if they were in it, but I wouldn't put them all in the first one because it was like just like 10, 20 seconds or whatever. And then the next day, I would like extend it by putting an advert on, like an extra bit on the front, extra bit on the back, and then just build it out over the course of the, the two-week shoot or whatever. And the, so there was like just like new content going out every day. And then like obviously all of the young people were having a brilliant time. You know, everyone's like eating, like, you know, it's, it's the long days and the, everyone's like, you know, sharing food together. You've got these young people now coming in, getting the hair, getting makeup done every day. They're a centre of attention. They've got like everything, all of their needs are taken care, for, like, care of and they're getting picked up and they're getting dropped back off at home and, and like sharing all of that on social media. And, and then it shot up. I don't know what happened, if I'm honest, but for some reason it picked up in India and it just started getting shared and it just... It, it just went crazy. I'm talking like, you know, maybe it's like 30,000 people in a, in a week or something instantly. And then I was talking to a friend of mine, an Asian guy, and he was like, Paul, when you look at Bollywood, everyone's got like, you know, everyone like sort of looks the same. And he says now all of a sudden, because like a few, a few of the cast members and, and their families and stuff are sharing it. Now all of a sudden there's this new TV series that you can control and it's got like a, a, a diverse cast and it's being shared by like people that they know. Do you know what I mean? And it's, and then we started to get like people to say, so once it started looking good, like adverts and stuff, you would slowly start to get people's friends. Like, oh my God, so proud of you, Paul, or, you know, like some of the actors or actresses or whatever, and family members, and it just, it just, it went crazy. And like India overtook the UK and was our biggest audience uh, for a bit. And then the Philippines overtook India, and then eventually America overtook, overtook the Philippines. And I'd put a post out somewhere, and it was... Like we've reached like, like so by this so like the page was like just growing exponentially it was just growing massive and then like i started to to look at like some like little things that i've done like if you talk about practical type tips i, I started like uh, scheduling a post every morning for six o'clock so the first thing that people do when they wake up in the morning is pick up the phone and have a look at the mobile phone so i'd schedule a post for six o'clock every morning and it'd be like something positive for the day ahead or like a joke or something funny it was never 
like the the way that the jokes were wrote, it was so sort of like you could share them. So it was like it was about about making you funny rather than like putting anyone down, and that's what we try to stay away from. It would be like stuff like you know I walk around like everything is fine, but deep inside I know my my sock is falling down or something. Do you know what I mean? Like I can feel my socks sliding down my foot or whatever. Or people would wake up in the morning, and it would be either uh, something funny or a little inspire like inspiring quote or whatever, and and then uh, they would like share it and and then like three o'clock in the afternoon became like a really important time for us because like it was people standing in the schoolyard or finishing school like or college or whatever around about that time but then america waking up was also about that time so like three half three in the afternoon was like always a good time to post something and it just started it just went absolutely bonkers and i remember putting out somewhere so like um it, were, it shot up to like a hundred thousand people when we launched episode one and then like and then i started to have a look at the production process and and, and show a lot more behind the scenes when we're done episode two everything from the auditions to the writing process and then and where are we at now in terms of years for like the first couple of episodes 2014 2014 now so we were, we were almost collapsed the business almost shut because i just i couldn't get a commission from anywhere and then eventually we got a commission uh from a, a local authority and i went down to southeast uh, to lewisham your neck of the woods and it went out to lewisham and that's when we started to like refine the production process a little bit and refine the engagement with the professionals and and with young people and then by this time when we were going in and doing workshops with college students and stuff we're like starting to get a photograph taken with all of these young people and or like you know sharing some stuff with them like create, recreating some scenes or whatever and just really pushing it out and but the one of the biggest things like ultimately was that is that young people believed in it like they genuinely are interested in things that affect them and like this generation you know the young people i've worked with are like they care about the planet and they care about their mental health and the and they want to understand like stuff like around sexual health and it's not a taboo subject you know it's something that like people want to engage with like proactively so um and if they can use their lived experiences in some of these to help other young young people like mate honestly they, they dive on it regardless of what the media say it's, in, it's interesting as well that it's like those topics that you've covered have really kind of transcended those cultural boundaries like the way it's picked up around the world even though you're filming in Lewisham there's people watching in Philippines and India and America and everywhere yeah uh that's it and like how many of them won't like you know they might not have access to a youth service or might not have access to services or or have limited access or in one week we had reached like this is like using a mobile phone I remember reaching like 188 million people. We had like 849 million social media impressions. That meant like trial life was shown like 849 million times, like on devices, nearly a billion. And then I posted it somewhere because it just felt like monopoly money to me. Like I just, I couldn't even like quantify, like, you know, like, or even like um, imagine like what that looked like. And then someone was like, that's like a percentage of the planet that you've hit, like using your phone. And then, I put like, oh, we reached 144 million Americans and like 25 million people in the UK. And they were like, that's like one in three people in, in the UK or something. And like, that's 65% of like all Facebook users in America. And, but like, I mean, like, that was, that was a couple of years ago. And then like Facebook just wants you to pay money to reach your audience now. They don't want you to reach your audience without giving them money, which is a real shame because some projects have got their, like, when it becomes about money, it takes your heart out of it. When it, when you, when I, when I look at Facebook now, I'm a lot, lot less interested in Facebook to be honest. I've got a lot less time for the potential of the platform. We're talking to a couple of other platforms at the, like, at the moment, but like at that time, we were pumping out like some pretty good stuff. You know, like we had like some articles wrote about like about mental health and about health and and we like, were uh, engaging with people. We had music sent in from all around the world. And then when we've done the mental health and uh, suicide episode, like that was, that was eye opening. I mean, like, I've lost like about 30 friends to suicide in probably the last like 12 years or something, 14 years. When we've done that, like I know for a fact I've saved lives with, with like engaging with people directly, like who sent messages in on trial life. And if you look at, I saw something on like a graph on Twitter about like how mental health is 
gets talked about like so much more and it's got to be a good thing it's a shame that services aren't there to be able to deal with it but like these kind of issues are issues that people care about so and like some people have said like oh try life's hard hitting and like oh like try life walks the line and it's not really like it's mate, it's like it's uncomfortable watching because it's uncomfortable for the people who haven't to go through it like it's just like we're taking people's stories about like, what actually happens and like it's not that we're creating anything hard hitting it's just when you watch it like you know you really feel it because it's it's wrote and acted and created by people who like you know who are passionate about the subject matter and who actually live in it and some of the some of the things whether it's uh, knife crime and gang violence you know some of the the things that the young people go through like are, are horrendous and i know you said that you can as you said you've you've received the messages so you know the difference it's made from like hearing about it in that way in that sort of natural sort of way have you been able to do any kind of like more formal evaluation that kind of like have you found a way of kind of capturing that stuff or or is it you know, just uh just from having heard the messages and getting that kind of stuff so we had uh, Sunderland University do some re-evaluation of the project I can send you over like the exact summary and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, we'll put it on the web page. Like, I'm sure people want to kind of dig in some of that. Yeah, man, uh, it's really interesting, man. Like, we're we're sort of the things that like stood out to me with it were like that I hadn't considered because I knew it. I knew it worked. Like, I just I could tell. I just knew. Like, but like we needed someone externally to come in and and like, really have a look at it. So I'll just read off some of the key lines here, right? So ninety three point nine percent of survey respondents told us that Try Life uh, TV co-production experience helped them develop critical thinking. 94% of survey respondents stated that Try Life experience helped them develop decision-making skills. 90.9% felt that Try Life experience had helped them gain skills and knowledge as a career related to media. And like the, the list goes on, you know, it's, it's a very effective form of, of engaging with young people because if you think about it, when, when I'm sitting down with young people and writing the storyline, um, it's very easy for some y- young people to talk about like, the knives, the guns, the drugs, and all of that kind of stuff. But then when you ask them to think about what positive life choices the character can make, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, maybe they could get a job. Maybe they could go to college. And they're like, all oh, right. And then we'll start writing all of that. But that in itself is like a really effective piece of youth work because like you are writing a film, but like what you're actually doing is like engaging with like a large number of young people around like storyline ideas and they're able to articulate what's happening to them in their real world and put that in. And they're making something that is an end product that they're proud of, that they can put their name to and will readily share with their friends and push that out there. And like, and for the viewers. So sometimes I'll be working with groups of young people and then you see the, the groups of young people will like, you know, maybe just pair them up or put three in a group like around a, a laptop and we're like, right, like just have a little shot. And they'll put no to the drugs, no to this, no to that, no to this. And then turn around and go, right, have I passed? And I'm like, it's not it's not a test, mate. It's not a test. Just go and make some mistakes. Like go and see what happens. Go and make some mistakes on behalf of the character. And then you can see them like, oh, it's not a test. Like, oh, let us go in. And then you get to see them starting to, to make these choices. And it's not about deciding what's right or wrong. It's about allowing them to experiment and see the consequences. And if like, the frontal part of your brain isn't fully developed until the like, their 20s, and that's part of, part of the reason why young people do stuff and then don't see the impact, the consequence that will happen until afterwards. And it's like... Uh, frontal cortex that's responsible for all of that isn't it so by allowing young people to go in and, and, and make mistakes on behalf of a film character i think it's i think it's a brilliant way of learning it works and it gives people like all of them skills like in helping pull it together all of them production skills and then at the end when we launch it we launch it normally in a cinema or whatever and then you get all of them young people to come with a red carpet out the photographer there sit down with their family and watch it and it's broadcast quality and it's it looks good and it's like it's them on a big screen and and it's and it's been it's been shown around the world you know and it's 
and there's people from all over the world engaging with it and some of them young people have went on now and like forged themselves very very successful careers in mainstream media but if their first experience of film isn't being exploited or or whatever you know you, you hear some horror stories don't you of like especially women in media and but like being involved in something that's like nurturing and, and knowing like what a good production set is like like you'll be able to spot a bad one in the future yeah we've helped set the career off of like of a lot of people and like you say it's beautiful just to see to see the the work being shared like everywhere so you've done the seven episodes is it and then the pandemic slowed things down for you a bit i guess hasn't it yeah so we've done the first episode was about drugs and alcohol sexual health the second one was about Knife crime, gang violence. Third one was mental health and suicide. Fourth was child sex exploitation and grooming. Fifth was isolation and loneliness. The sixth one was a bolt on to that, and it was the characters coming out of COVID. And then the seventh was teenage pregnancy and perinatal mental health. Uh, so when was it? When when did you kind of finish that series? Like when was the seventh one done? During lockdown, when there was like when there was a break, and it looks like I might be funded for our next one, which is gambling. And that'll be in the northeast. Uh, okay, cool. Because I was going to ask, like, what are the longer term plans? Like, I know you've got the project out in LA that hopefully you get back to now that you can get back out there and stuff. And so, is the plan like to do more and more episodes of Try Life and keep it going like that, or is there is it like going and doing stuff in different parts of the world, or is there like a, a kind of next step to it? Does it evolve in something like what? What do you where do you think it's going to go from here? Yeah, so there's still some subject matters that we need to cover. So gambling is one of them, and there's like there's a couple of others that I would I would like to do. So we've amassed like this like huge wealth of of filmed uh, material. So we're currently developing like an e-learning section called Try Learning, and uh, we've wrote like educational material around mental health, drugs and alcohol, quality and like sexual health, all sorts of stuff. We've wrote educational material around. So. I think that's what the, the the next stage of it is like. Want to try and roll this out nationwide? I think is it, it looks like it's already going to be used in fifteen areas this year. So like, that's what that's what the bigger plan is. But there's still only me on the team, and we scale up massively when it comes to a film production. But like that's what it needs. It it, it needs to move from uh, being funded like per film, like episodically, into something. Uh, sustainable like like a license agreement or something like that with with the areas but the more films we make the more content we've got the more wealth of of material we've we've got in there and it'll never replace a face-to-face worker but like it's like we start we've covered like we've covered a lot of the main issues that young people face so and because it's been made by them it's not some rubbish campaign that that like does like doesn't have any impact. Or if you look at like old poster campaigns, like who reads them? How can you like if you're putting chlamydia advice on beer mats? Like who's ever went for a pint and looked at a chlamydia advice on beer mat and thought I'm going to go and get myself checked out? Like not anyone that I know. Or putting like knife cream advice on chicken boxes in Southeast London. Like how am I? Like what's that even going to do? And if you like, I just think it's a participation. Like young people are passionate about these things, and it's not like you have to try and make something that's cool. Like you don't have to try and come up with a new cool gimmick to get in with the kids. It's like make something with them. Like just involve people. Like involve the community, involve the people that have been involved in it, involve the services. And some of them gang members that were in our film were sat side by side getting their photographs taken with the police when we launched that episode. Do you know what I mean? Because the police had chipped in and helped. The police were on set. When the police were on set, bringing their police cars, or they'd give us use of Cadford Police Station because that had been shut down. So, like, we got that use of that themselves. And, like, that's when, like, them young people were, like, turning up to the police station happy because, like, you know, they were going on set. And it's, like, when there was a couple of police officers there having a laugh and having a joke on with them young people, that's when them young people connected with them because, like, they're there because we're using their police cars and we're using their cells or whatever to make this like thing look real and the, the, the police help with all of that kind of stuff and like that's like that's when the engagement happens with in between what we're talking about earlier with in between like bridging that sort of cultural divide that's like it's those kind of moments that, that happens yeah yet another outcome there that you're getting out of it as well isn't it so much success like 
tell us about some of the awards you've won because I know there've, there's been a whole bunch of stuff that you guys have been awarded for. Yeah, so we won Innovation Awards in Health and Social Care in Business and Youth Work, came runner-up in Outstanding Contribution to Youth Work, came runner-up in an Innovation Award for the Royal Television Society Award for Film Production. We won like any amount of placement provider awards with universities, International Film Award, we obviously won in both People's Choice and the overall award at uh, Pitch at the Palace. Once we'd won uh, Pitch at the Palace, like, that's the thing that started to get recognised a bit. And it took me a while to realise that I wasn't a youth worker anymore, really. That like we were being seen as a film production company. I wasn't being seen as a as a as a youth worker. I were being seen as a you know, like as a successful production company. So we got took over to America with the Department of International Trade. And we were a bit of a wild card because the rest of the organizations were like sort of traditional filmmakers and we weren't. And when we're over there, I presented Try Life to like this audience and everyone else was like sort of selling films or doing whatever they're doing. We just got up and like sort of spoke about like, this is like the kind of stuff that we're making, engaging with young people. So this woman had come over and asked us to go to Compton with her which is in South Central. So I turned up at her house the next day and there's like pictures of her with Harrison Ford and Ridley Scott and Steve McQueen and stuff. And I didn't know how, like who, who she was or like whose house I was in. She was like, did I tell you what I'd done? And I was like, no. She was like, well, I produced Blade Runner. So I'm now like driving to Compton with the producer of Blade Runner. And it was just like a surreal experience. And I'm now teaching these young people in, in the classroom about how you don't need to be like a wealthy white man from Hollywood to make a film and you know you've got the power in your pocket to do it and and then like so what came about from that was when I, I'd finished uh, engaging with these young people in the school like we didn't have money for like expensive aerial shots or drone shots so we had to get creative so we would have like sometimes the actors acting out in the city centre and put £10 free to inf- information requesting to get the CCTV footage you know what I mean off the council and like just had to find innovative ways around like right, what we needed. So I'm engaging with these uh, young people and saying like, you know, you can use social media t- uh, to like for your benefit. And when I came out of there, there was a, a woman that I met and she was like, what are you doing here? And I showed her the trailer. And then um, she got on the phone and was like to this guy, like, Terry, you need to check this guy's work out. He's like a white man in Compton. He's works off the hook and ended up meeting like all of the heads of the Crips gang. So there's two main gangs over there, like the Bloods and the Crips. I ended up like going out and having a few beers with the guys who like founded the Crips, basically. I was sort of, when I was engaging with them, like having a chat with them, I was just like, why don't we try and do something? Why don't we tell like the real story and not the Hollywood story? Why don't we tell like the real story about how this come around? And they're like, yeah. So we ended up, I ended up like pulling an event together where I'd like met the head of the Mexican Mafia and um, and some of the guys from the Bloods as well. And we put this event on where like all three factions came together. It 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 was just like it it had the, the potential to change the world, this project. I came back and I presented it to Facebook London. And I said like, look, we've got something here that could be society changing. Why don't we interview these uh, founding members of the gangs and then show a fly on the wall documentary on my Facebook watch of like this fictitious episode being pulled together like in the background and then I went and presented it like Facebook UK, Facebook Europe, I was on stage at Facebook Grow speaking with like Louis Theroux was like on stage and stuff it was weird and um but brilliant and then they were going to fly us over to San Francisco to go and present it to like Facebook Global and then that's when the financial crisis happened not the financial crisis, that's when the pandemic happened. So the world just stopped and it's like I had this, like, I had quite a lot of momentum going and it was like almost across the line where I just had to go and like sort of present it over there. Can you imagine like getting, following like, you know, like hearing the real stories from these guys and they all come, they're all coming together to talk about it and like, and then following the young kid from the street just like we do with Trial I Follow and then from the street into audition, into script read through, into wardrobe, onto set and demystifying the full thing and getting the whole community to help make this film, this restorative piece, could have been amazing. But I'd, be, I'd been awarded a bursary by an organisation called A Million Realities. And uh, it was a friend of mine who was, he used to head up Children's Society, and he got in touch with us and, and had said, 
uh, Paul, I've been a facilitator or like a mentor on this bursary uh, the year before, like the previous cohort, and they're now looking for like more people and you have to be referred on to it. And he was like, I think it would benefit you loads. And um, I thought throughout my career, like I'd been like quite a cathartic thing, you know, working with people. And I thought I'd done pretty well at uh, repairing like myself as or make myself as strong as I could by helping other people. And, you know, like a lot of that work I've, like dealt with me own issues as well as like you know helping other people but like I always felt like it benefited us loads it like it just it helped loads like from a mental health point of view um but I think I was wrong to be honest so I went and done I got, I, I, put, I poured my heart into this bursary and I don't know why but it just felt like the right time I felt like I'd helped people all my life like why not like this one time because there was like loads of mental health support in it and the whole point of the bursary was to find eight social entrepreneurs with projects based in the UK, which have got the ability to to change the world. And it was all about putting the founder on their feet. And there's loads of bursaries out there that will help support the business or the idea, but how many actually support the person? And I just, I don't know what it is. It just resonated with us and it just like sort of, it felt like the right thing at the right time. So I poured my heart into this application form and said like, look, start to build this massive global brand it's like it's just me and i'm i'm not like a traditional businessman i know like that you know i'm a like i'm a youth worker at heart and i'm creating this thing and i like, I really need some support and plus um i feel like i've helped myself as far as i can help myself and like it would be nice to like for the first time to engage in some kind of some kind of work you know but i thought i didn't realize how much I, how much work i I actually needed to be honest so I got accepted onto the bursary anyway the Bloods Crips and Mexican Mafia thing had sort of just like come to a stop because of because of COVID and just before lockdown they told us to meet them at uh, Heathrow Airport so I, I went out to Heathrow and I met the other seven fellows for the first time and they gave, were, were playing tickets and they flew over to Morocco and we spent a week on this like this retreat the massive hotel that they booked out for just us beautiful and there was a professor of psychology there and there was someone that does like uh, body massage and someone that does meditation and someone that does body work and like all of this kind of stuff, you know, was like foreign to me, you know, I'm from like, a council house in estate and I've not like done any of that. Plus I've done this thing with the course where it, it was called a Hogan's assessment and it's almost like a spider graph of like who you are. It shows you like, you know, like who you are. So my trust and respect for authority was like zero me empathy and creativity was like through the roof like complete opposite end me mischievousness is right up there and me tradition is like zero so you could like literally plonk us anywhere and i would like thrive like and in, in, in anywhere and it was weird saying it and then being able to relate back to like my career and like obviously like you know me upbringing and what was brilliant about doing that was they're like paul sometimes you're looking at people suspiciously and thinking like what do they want and sometimes people don't want anything they just want to help you and like that's what you've got to be careful of and what you've also got to be careful of is this and then they get you to have a look at where your skill set is and some things it is pointless you trying to learn or train yourself to do like you may as well just get someone in who like someone might be more process driven and mine might be more like me head in the clouds thinking of like creativity and and it's about marrying getting a team around you that like fit all of them different gaps where where you you display them or in like using your benefits to to maximum you know to to maximum effect so i went out with morocco we've done like like a daily set like it was proper grueling like you know it was like first thing in the morning to last thing at night it's the first time i've like just sat and been still like meditated and we could hear the call of prayer bouncing around the hills and stuff you know it was beautiful and but i came back like a completely broken man like it just ripped us apart i realized that i hadn't prepared myself i'd hidden from myself so I've done weekly therapy sessions with a psychologist on Zoom. And then eventually I've done EMDR therapy for post-traumatic stress, which was, that happened when lockdown eased. So it would take a little red light, like a little night rider light, you know, on the front of the night rider car. And you've got a vibrating pad in each hand. So when it goes left, the left pad vibrates. When it goes right, the right pad vibrates. And you talk about like, the trauma and it forces your both hemispheres of your brain to be activated and it sort of takes it away from that central core of your brain because a lot of my responses in the past have been fight or flight and like and not always like needed like I, 
like you know sometimes I would react in a way that was because I felt threatened or whatever uh mm-hmm. and like so that was like that was that was that was horrendous it, like it really was uh hell but it was mad because like when I was doing the EMDR like basically they get you to talk about whatever happened and then as soon as that thought's gone they're right right next one and keep going and keep going and it's very quick fire mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you start to see this little thread of like memory and then it's like attached to something from your childhood or like you know like i was like one minute sitting on me nana's coal shed and she was passing us a sandwich and then the next minute like in a really bad place and but then like at the time it, you can see like how it's all woven together and it isn't like linear or like a timetable like a school timetable or like your nine to five it's it's just fascinating and i had like i had some really tough weeks with that like i was like i cried for a, a long time and I went through hell with that, but I'm pleased I did because I came out the other side with a quarter of my brain freed up. Like I could like physically feel like a difference like inside my head. And then I'd done a Hoffman course for childhood trauma and behavioral patterns. That was a week's intensive course. It was one of the best courses I've ever done in my life. And I started to have a look at, I, I was diagnosed with mania and that really helped us see like how my manic behavior is run through all of my work that sort of need to like do stuff do stuff do and keep yourself busy and having like real ups and downs you know like when i'm up like it's like creative stuff like trial life will come from it and but like that comes at a cost and like it's different doing a podcast with you because i know like we, we, we know each other a, a little bit and stuff you know we've like spoke before but like things like getting up on stage and having to perform like really take it out of me like you know it takes like days for us to build myself up to be able to get up and perform and then like the, the come down from it is you know it takes a, a couple of days to get over that as well so and um yeah just like i've done this uh, made for course which was this is all paid for by my bursary now there's no way i could have afforded this i've done meditation i've done consolation i've done hypnotherapy yeah i was just thinking it's like it's just a, a bit of a follow-up question just but i don't want to interrupt you there but not a well, first of all, just want to say like thanks for sharing all of that because I think it's really important for people who do see what comes out of when you're like up and you know creating stuff and like then people don't see the crash afterwards, do they? So I think it's important like people do see the whole picture and then people realise that actually like maybe they can do something like that because everyone kind of sees the big successes and doesn't see the days where you're like less productive and stuff and we all have those kind of both sides to us. But also I was just thinking with people that maybe do want to do some of that work to deal with their own stuff, which, as you say, it's hard, so we all tend to avoid it. But when people do want to do some of that, and obviously people won't have that kind of bursary, do you know, have you got any thoughts on like where where people are best to look for support or anything for them to to anywhere to go to start to do some of that internal work? The best course, I, like, one of the best courses I've done was the Hoffman course. and But I know that's like three and a half thousand pounds or something. I know you can pay for it. It's, still, it's a lot of money. But like, it's three and a half grand well spent. Like, I mean, I didn't pay for mine, so it's easy for me to say that. Like, But like, if I could recommend anything out of all of them, that would be it. When I've done uh, some constellation work with a guy called Illy, I think that's less expensive. I think that's like, maybe it's like 100, 150 pound a session. And that was life changing for me. That like, so is there is there a link or something you can send me, and I'll, I'll get that up on the page and stuff as well. Oh yeah, I, yeah. Like, I tell you, one of the things I've done with him, right? Because I think often people don't know where to start with it, because it, like you say, like mental health services and things have been cut, and a lot of the kind of youth work stuff's been cut. So, and it's everyone should have access to the stuff I've just done there. Like for me, it was like it was quite overwhelming, you know. Yeah. Because like, if I like. It felt, it felt like I'd help people all my life, and this is the first time like someone was wanting to help me. And there was like no conditions, no questions. And they just wanted to get me the best I could be. And like that was like a beautiful thing, like that kind of gratitude. And then uh, being able to do them courses. With uh, Ilya, I'd done a session with him where he asked us what the blockers were. And I said, like, I'm worried that I've took trial life as far as I can take it. And like, I'm not quite sure what to do next. And um, he got us to shut the eyes. It's going to sound weird, this, right? But I'm going to tell you anyway, because it was beautiful. Got us to shut the eyes. So this is like during lockdown. Got us to shut the eyes and imagine that I'd stood up 
and stood out of myself. He'd obviously like hypnotized us or whatever, right? But like obviously I didn't even didn't know or nothing. You know, I'm just fucking sponge show I'm under, right? And he was like, step out of yourself. He was like, just want you to trust us. I know this sounds mad, but step out of yourself and turn around and have a look. And it was like a mannequin, right? This this like this is like it it was there right in front of us and it was me but it was featureless but it was me and it was like glowing red and he was like how does it feel and i was like it feels brilliant i feel safe i feel protected and it was like lovely standing right in front of me like it was one of the best feelings in the world and he was like right i want you to walk along to the next pole that worked at bernardo's what color is that what's the color pole at the bbc and like walk along and explain what they all looked like. And every single one of them had like a different feel. And he said, I want you to walk back along the line and shake hands with uh, Paul that's on fire and got tried of kicking and screaming to where it is and shake his hand and say, thank you very much. I'm going to need you again in the future sometime, but thank you for getting me now. And got us to walk back along the line to a different Paul, turn around and step back into it. And it was like, like that there was... It, it'll sound mad it'll sound absolutely mental or it might do but i tell you what it was one of the best things in the world like i like I woke up i just woke up like with a new perspective and i could with like clarity and a lot of the things that were clouding me were just they weren't like, i just needed like, to have like, a, a slightly different approach to it it was like daft things as well I was explaining to the therapist like this feeling I had in my stomach and I always would like have like stomach pains like every three months like clockwork and it was all stress related but like I just accepted it as a part of everyday life and I like, just knew I was going to be ill for like a week every now and again when we're doing EMDR and and doing all of this therapy I said to the, the psychologist I was I was like, I get this feeling and he was like tell us when it's happened and I was like oh it happened to you it happened there and he was like right because you were scared and I was like wow and it sounds mad, but it was like really overwhelming at the time because I hadn't took the word scared and, and like had that feeling together, right? There was like, there was something missing. Do you know what I mean? Like the ability like to connect the two of them. And and then like it, cas- it had a cascading effect because I can remember like a thousand times I've had that feeling and stuff, but I don't get that feeling in, and I've never had a pain in my stomach like, you know, for a year. And it was like small things like that, just like, like the nuances of, like some conversation I'm not always like pick up on and and like doing all of that kind of therapy just like helped us see all of that get a better understanding of like who I am and my and my place and and then like every so often I'll get like a little flash of trial life where I'm like extremely proud and I'm like whoa sh-. like look what I've done like wow and as quick as it comes is as quick as it goes like it just it, it isn't there for us to like experience it it's like a weird thing you know it's like uh, sitting down with a psychologist and stuff and like say like that one thing about like being scared or whatever was just like you know one of many things that it like sort of came out and i realized like how disconnected i am from a lot of things but super well connected and in, in like other ways the hogan assessment also sort of reinforced all of that that's not an expensive thing to do the hogan assessment i think that's like a really good starting point because you can start to have a look at where your strengths and weaknesses are and and just because you're a hundred or whatever on some, like with me, I'm very off or on. Obviously, me empathy is through the roof because I had to deal, like, navigate very complex adults from an early age. And but it was just beautiful to see. I think like that was like I think for me advice for anyone from the courses I've done anyway, because I've only done the courses I've done. I found the Hogan assessment a really good starting point, especially for me because I need to look at stuff like from a like a technical point of view. I've got to like look at it and and see it and, and see where i'm at and then the work with illy and uh like the sort of constellation work was absolutely amazing and i got a lot from uh meditating as well but i don't do it when i'm by myself it's not something i i don't sit down now and and continue it but like when i was with the fellows like when there was eight of us sat there together in meditating like that felt like good when there was like me amongst a group so but like I would I done some really heavy lifting like during uh lockdown but I feel like I came out I came out of it a, like a different person it's mad the response you get when I, you know when I t- tell some people I've been doing therapy like, I don't know if they think I've been like locked in a padded cell or whatever you know what I mean or like 
if there's something crazy like what, what, what you're going to therapy for as if you're soft but you know like i tell you what i'd rammed everything into the cupboard and shut that door and like kept working and kept working and kept working and, and doing anything to hide myself from myself and then during lockdown i opened that cupboard and everything fell out on top of us and i thought why have i opened this door and it wasn't just opening the door it's picking everything and going oh no and having to live that and experience that again some stuff i'd forgot about some stuff i didn't want never wanted to see some stuff was in the bottom of that cupboard for a reason and i've just ripped everything out and i'm now holding it and feeling it everything and bit by bit some of it was thrown away because it doesn't i don't need it anymore and some of it was packed neatly in that cupboard and it was i'd done some really heavy lifting like proper heavy lifting but some of them experiences have like changed this changed this way I'm, I'm i'm i've never been happier i've never ever ever been happier and what kills us about that is the amount of people that have lost to suicide because they were crying out for for help for support i've had a friend recently who has been waiting two years for grief counseling and been given like 10 10 weeks worth of grief counseling after the loss of his dad and that's like an hour a week for 10 weeks i mean it's brilliant that he's got it it's two years later and he's had some dark days him like and all of his friends and family have like really had a rally at times and i've got other friends who have cried out for support and killed themselves like a lot of friends like i'm talking like easy 30 people easy and that bursary that was awarded to me changed my life for 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 the best i'm like i'm happy being alone i'm happy in my own company i'm happy in my own head my head's a lot clearer uh, i look at like, I know mania sounds like, I'm just like a maniac or not, but it's not, it's like bursts of manic behavior. It's bursts of work. And I was working like seven days a week, 18 hours a day, just massive, like, you know, just massive energy input, but then burning out. I remember uh, just before Christmas once and someone had texted us and I couldn't even respond to a text message, right? That's how burnt out I was. I'd like not, I'd had like 10 days off in like five years or something. So this is like December or, or whenever, and I couldn't even respond to a text. I'm staring at the screen and I've tried writing it and I can't even get words out. Like that's how bad I get. And then like, I remember once talking to the guy who does me branding and I'm like, oh, Gary, can you just do this? Can you just do that? Could you just uh, change that and just send this? And then it was someone I was in the living room with, like at the time, I, I think maybe it's my son or my daughter were like, it's Christmas Eve. <laughs> it was like a Friday or whatever, you know what I mean? It's Christmas Eve. And I'm like, shit, Gar sorry for swearing. I'm like, oh, Gary, mate, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's Christmas Eve. Do you? He's like, no, I'll do it, Paul. I take mine, I'm not doing it, you know what I mean? And I'm like, no, 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 leave it, leave it, leave it. It's Christmas Eve, mate. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And like, I love um, the Christmas, uh, uh, was it Christmas Tale, Christmas Carol, or whatever it's called, you know, that Christmas movie with Scrooge, what's it called? Ah, <laughs> uh, the Bill Murray one. And I'm like, <laughs> I Scrooge. And I'm like, I'm like, no, Gary, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, no. And I thought, mate, give it a rest. But it was like always one more text, one more email. I'll just do this, I'll just do that. And then, like, I think um, because of that, uh, and then that text message that I couldn't send, right, after three days of Christmas being off, or four days of Christmas, I looked at this text message, mate, and it took us, like, three seconds to write, like, just whatever I had to respond took like three seconds, but I physically like stared at that screen for like 20 minutes or something and just couldn't come up with like even a thought to be able to do it. And I thought like, that's like, just, I'm not even like that. That's not productive. It's not, that's not healthy at all. And like through, through doing that therapy and then having a look at like that kind of and behavioral patterns and then having a little look into like mania and like manic behavior and, and then relating it back to, my work patterns in the past I'll, I'll put some things into place that that uh have like really changed my life and like i'll take time off now and like i'll and not feel guilty whereas I, I would always feel guilty and like having a weekend or whatever it's the most important thing in the world you know and if one day i wake up it doesn't matter like so every day i try to do one thing for trial life even if it's send a text or send an email just one thing every day to push the project forward and even if i can't do anything else just one text, just one message, just one thing. So every day I feel like I've achieved something and that's what I, I try to do. But I'm just like so much easier on myself, so less hard on myself. And it's just a real shame that that kind of level of therapy isn't available to everyone. But I know that 
what we're doing with a million realities now is because there's a previous cohort of eight people and the second cohort which i was part of of eight people is a lot of the fellows who have come together with antonia who set a million realities up and we're having a look at like what can we do now to like to help more people like on mass so it'll not be i don't think it'll be as intensive as the therapy that we undertook but it might be like studio sessions or like more things where more people can get involved in it and like involved in whatever we create so it's still in its infancy and we're just like sort of coming together and and looking at like what can we put out there and how can we engage with a much wider audience definitely whatever kind of comes out of that let me know and definitely share that stuff as well and maybe talk a bit more about that next time well thanks paul i mean i know i've, I've took up loads more extra time than we'd planned to uh we've ended up going a bit long so i appreciate your time is there anything any final stuff any any messages you want anything you want to say to people that might be listening i think the next sort of projects that, like that we're going to be doing is a climate action app for younger kids so if anyone's interested in climate change or climate action like we've got to have a chat because that's like it's it's a animation that like we're we're just in the final stages of pulling it all together and, and getting that released so that's been like that's been really interesting working on like a little kids tv show type thing which has been pretty cool been even better uh auditioning hammerhead sharks and hedgehogs and because you know when you're when you're normally making a feature film you've got like, a person in mind but like trying to put a casting call out for a little hedgehog is is it's honestly been the most beautiful thing in the world if anyone out there is doing some work with young people or or whatever just get in touch and um and, ch- and check out try life have a little look you know, like nearly all of our work has just come from like word of mouth and and just connecting with people who are doing like either a piece of research or have got like a project or like a, a specific area in mind and it's we're just we've we've done some really creative really creative work with like young people you know covered some hard hitting issues so if anyone's doing anything like that I get in touch and if anyone needs a, wants a hand with you know some ideas for social media or engaging with young people workshops out like that get in touch and um cool nice one thanks for your time again paul that's great we'll get everything together and put, put all those kind of links to resources and things and share the evaluation and stuff like that on the website so people can can look stuff up Thank you for listening to this episode of the Charity Impact Podcast and thank you for listening all the way to the end. Just one more thing before you go. If you listen to the podcast, I'd love to hear what you think. You can either leave a review on Spotify, Apple, etc. or tag me in a post on LinkedIn or Twitter at alexblake underscore K-E-D-A or just drop me an email. For details on all episodes with notes and links to resources, head to our website kedaconsulting.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care.